Okay, so uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, first, first time at the Galilei Institute, although, and um, and very nice to see such a big uh, and big crowd here of uh, of students in in these lectures. So my my topic is small x physics and plasma dynamics in ultra do is maybe I'm not sure I will talk about plasma dynam dynamics, but I will try to somehow give a little bit of a background of where this plasma, where this plasma field uh, comes from. So the um, I will be mostly doing blackboard blackboard lectures apart from just the first twenty minutes today. Um, there's a lecture note which I have been somehow accumulating over the years and I will probably update it dur sometime during this week so I will somehow there are still quite, uh, things that I'm fixing things that I'm fixing but I will post the updated version on the same uh, website there's also a couple of exercise questions that I propose that we look at this afternoon and then I think we have a shorter shorter other exercise session uh, later this week they are also uh, also posted there I mean the ones that I put there are the things that I have for the whole week so part of them for this afternoon and uh, part four, part four later. Um, yes, um, that's uh, so. Lecture note: work in progress. A few words about literature. If you want to look for more, most of what I do is kind of more or less based on on these two books. So, which are kind of the, this book? These are books that are good for kind of the CGC part, uh, kind of. Deep elastic scattering, maybe proton nucleus collisions, a little bit less for kind of the plasma heavy. Idea. So, uh, Baroni and Predazzi, I like a lot, although it's it's getting a little bit old. It somehow misses the more really a book about CGC, but it has a lot of the background that that one really needs in these things. So I like this book a lot. Kovchegov and Levin is a little bit. Kovchegov and Levin is a little bit uh, newer or newer and somehow more focused, but even that is kind of more for DIS, EIC physics. A little bit, le no, it has a little bit about heavy ion collisions, but not that much. Okay. It's a very useful book. And then in the lecture note, there's a couple of review articles and so on that, uh, that are very useful. And maybe more also heavy ion focused than, than these books. Okay, so the plan for classes is that, as you see, it, it's going to take us to the last uh, last lecture to actually get to the glasma. What I what I want to do is that to discuss in the first class today. I want to discuss iconal scattering. Uh, then I will discuss the the next. Uh, lecture will be the high, the so-called hybrid formalism of particle production in proton nucleus collision. So that's already, we will be able to somehow have, well, I wouldn't, we will be looking at data, but, but I want to give you a feeling of, of what are the ingredients that actually go into cross-section calculations that people have compared to data and that can be compared to data and that are relevant for understanding data in a proton nucleus collisions at forward rapidity and then we kind of start going more to the cgc and uh, cgc and plasma physics uh, stuff so i i try to because because somehow these lectures are based on courses that uh, that i have prepared with the idea that that you don't necessarily need to have a quantum field theory background to understand of course i mean the cgc is a classical field theory it's a classical classical effective theory so a lot of the things kind of have a have some Q, Q effects, but but in some sense I will not kind of I will not assume that you are able to calculate loop diagrams here. Maybe I know the level of student varies, and some people have more experience with. Some of you will will find a lot of what I'm saying very boring and factory and things that you already know. But hopefully. Hopefully there will be something that uh, will be useful to you at, at some point uh, in these lectures. Okay, 
So today, the, the idea is iconal scattering, uh, iconal scattering, which is high energy scattering. And then tomorrow we go to uh, actual proton nucleus collision. So before we go to iconal scattering, somehow the a few somehow terminology or, or background notes. <clears throat> so we are here talking about uh, partons. So the, the, the idea of a parton was originally introduced by Björkain. So the statement, so the idea is that at high energy hadrons consist of point line constituents, which Björkain called partons. And it was only kind of later I realized that you can identify these point like constituents with quarks and gluons. The idea of partons was introduced before one knew about before one knew about uh, quarks and gluons, really. Or, or not, quarks were not considered real particles; they were kind of somehow abstract mathematical tools to understand systematics in in hadron spectra. <clears throat> okay, partons are characterized by two things: uh, the longitudinal momentum fraction and some transfer scale. So. The way I would like to argue is that in some sense, on a conceptual level, the idea of a parton only really makes sense in the infinite momentum frame. Uh, partons are not just quarks and gluons in general. Quark, partons are quarks and gluons as constituents of a high energy proton or nucleus going very somehow. You can do calculations in any current frame, but the conceptual kind of the way you think about partons is that you boost or nucleus to a very high energy and then the partons are the constituent of this high energy high energy um, nucleus or proton <clears throat> so so because you're boosting the whole thing to high energy the partons are already also kind of to a first approximation collinear so they carry some fraction of the longitudinal moment of the parent and then they carry some and then there is some transverse momentum scale or some q squared hardness scale and what I find it, what I find very useful is to think of X always as a longitudinal momentum and Q squared, for example, Q squared in DIS, you can do it in any frame, but for me, it's useful Q squared as a transverse momentum scale. Okay, so what is that in, you can look at the DIS cross section and the Q squared dependence is just like for a point like particle, to a first approximation that that was evidence for protons consi consisting of some kind of point like constituents that was the that was the start of the parton parton model uh, in these pictures we are moving in the realm of high energy limit so which means that we will always be interested in x being very small and somehow we will be moving in a regime where we are interested in partons that carry very so somehow maybe some somewhat counterintuitively we are interested in the high energy regime which means that we are looking at low energy particles so this may but the way you should think about think of this is that we want to look at x being small and in order for x in order for us to be able to do a scattering experiment where we probe small X particles, we have to accelerate the proton or nucleus to a very high energy. We want to accelerate the proton or nucleus to such a high energy that even the small X particles have momenta of the order of GVs, and we can measure them in a perturbative scattering experiment <clears throat> at, at somehow the one GV scales for the partons that we are interested in, and then the whole proton or nucleus has has a TeV TeV scale energy. So that's why small x is high energy. In in kind of the jargon of the field, small x physics is high energy uh, QCD. High energy physics is more general, but high energy QCD is small energy uh, small x physics. Okay. So and then just to set set the, a little bit of conventions and notations. These are things that are probably obvious to some of you and um, obvious to most of you, but uh, so just as a quick reminder, <clears throat> we typically think in terms of rapidity. And I think this is what Leif was already kind of assuming, uh, assuming that you know. So we have, we can define a momentum space rapidity Y, which is related to the velocity. We, you can express it by saying that the Z component of the velocity of a particle is the hyperbolic tangent of the rapidity or 
that the energy and momentum of the part of a particle are should, just, energy and momentum are the hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine of uh, the rapidity. Okay, so why is the why is the rapidity why is the it is useful. The rapidity is useful because the rapidity is additive in a Lorentz boost in the longitudinal direction. So when you boost a part, uh, boost your system in the longitudinal direction, uh, it changes in a simple way. Of course, you cannot, you don't have a kind of a similar, similar nice thing for boosts in the transverse direction. But that's another kind of typical feature of this high energy, high energy limit is that for us, the Z axis, the collision axis is very special. So we're gonna be all the time using a language that is not at all rotationally invariant. We are looking at a physical situation where the physical situation breaks rotational invariance in a dramatic way. The physical situation is high energy protons on the Z axis. So we're gonna be thinking in terms of coordinate, thinking in terms of coordinates and variables well, longitudinal physics is very is a very different than transverse physics, right? So we don't care about three dimensional rotational invariance that much. This is why we use rapidity defined from the three uh, z component of the momentum because we want it things to be boost easily boostable or boost invariant in the longitudinal direction along the beam axis. We are, and that comes at the expense of. I mean, we're we're not worried about things being boost invariant in transverse directions. We are we work in the transverse direction. We're working in a specific coordinate frame, which is uh, the center of center of mass frame. But we want to be able to boost things in the longitudinal direction. This is, so. This is why we always have this separation: transverse and and longitudinal. And maybe as a potentially as a slight difference to what Leif is uh, what Leif is doing. For me, longitudinal and transverse are always with respect to the beam axis. Uh, when Leif is talking about string fragmentation, that might be with respect to the axis of the string or the axis of the final state particles, a little bit uh, more in a more complicated, complicated way. For me, transverse and longitudinal are always with respect to the beam axis of the particles that scatter. Okay, so another source of confusion that somehow people say transverse and they forget to say transverse with respect to what and that leads to that can lead to confusion so just as a warning so the other coordinate system which uh, i will use is that i will use light variables so instead of thinking about uh, long time component z component of a vector I will use the plus component and the minus component. So here also, if you want to actually do a calculation and read some reads and references, there's an unfortunate uh, there's an unfortunate um, mismatch of conventions. I I use what is known as the Kogut-Soper metric, which is different from the Brodsky-Lepage metric. So I have square root twos, where some authors have ones or twos. I think like Magian has a different metric. And uh, so, but you shouldn't let that distract you from the physics, but just to not get confused by tools and square root tools. There are, be aware that there are different conventions. So a scalar product of the of two vectors in terms of the light cone components is the plus component times the minus component, plus minus component times plus component, minus then the transverse components. The square of a vector is two times the plus component times the minus component minus the transverse components. If you want to write this in, in a covariant way, the metric tensor is non off diagonal in this plus minus transverse transverse uh, components. And also, this means that the raising and lowering indices is not just a sign, but the vector with an index plus up is the same as an index minus down, right? So it may. So here, it, at least if you use my conventions, it really matters whether your index is up or whether it's down. Plus up is the same as minus down. And unfortunately, different fields of high energy physics, people have different conventions. Uh, easy to get confused by these if you actually really want to want to uh, get the precise connection. But just for reference, here are here are my conventions. 
Okay, so why do we want to use these light cone variables? Of course, the natural thing is that we want to study particles that are going at close to the speed of light in the z direction, right? So our z axis is very special. So this means that for a very high energy particle, uh, it will going in the positive direction, positive z direction, it will have a very large p plus. Then if we require that this particle is on a mass shell, it's going to have a very, very small p minus, right? So that's a typical kind of way of organizing, organizing what is large and what is small. It's kind of the way you think, the way you think is, okay, I have particles with large p plus. So p plus is large. Transverse momentum and mass are kind of not that large, but of big, typically could be of the same order as, as each other. And then P minus is proportional to one over the large mass. So P minus is small. So somehow you can, of course, do this in a Lorentz covariant way. I, I prefer to do it in, a, I prefer to do these kind of things in, a, in, a, in kind of an explicit uh, coordinate system. So this gives you, in some sense, a, a scale separation. It's P plus is large, transverse is smaller, and P minus is even smaller. And we're going to be thinking about situations where, where we cl clearly have this kind of a ordering in, in, in how large different components of moment are. Okay, so a Lorentz invariant phase space, if you need to integrate over four-dimensional phase space of on-shell particles, typically when you, do, when you do particle physics, when you do field theory, when you do, a, I don't know, a relativistic kinematics, typically you would eliminate this on-shell condition by integrating over P0, the zero component of total momentum. What I do is that I, I eliminate this, I want to eliminate this always by integrating over P minus. And, and so this is kind of what, related in some way to what is known as light con perturbation theory. I'm not gonna, I'm kind of trying to avoid speaking in a, on a formal level about light cone perturbation theory, but it's a little bit in the background in, in the background in, in a lot of what I do. So the connection there is that in light cone perturbation theory, the minus component of the momentum is the energy. So P minus is the light cone energy because X plus is the light cone time. And X plus and P minus are conjugate to each other because that's what the metric is, the amount that it's x, x dot p is x plus p minus. As, so x plus and p minus are conjugate to each other. And the thing that is conjugate to the light cone time x plus is the light cone energy p minus. So, so I, when I want to go from a Lorentz invariant, these four-dimensional integrals to on-shell particles, I eat this, eat this delta function by doing the p minus integral. So then a phase space integral is transverse in the transverse momentum and then dp plus. And then you see that from this delta function, you pull out the one over p, p plus. So a the Lorentz invariant phase space integral for the momenta of some particle on shell is transverse momentum and dp plus over p plus, uh, which is just rapidity. So naturally, again, you see that rapidity goes naturally with Lorentz rapidity is natural when you put it together with Lorentz boosts in the z direction, because the Lorentz, a Lorentz invariant phase space measure in terms of moment in terms of is very simple in terms of rapidity. So something that is flat as a function of rapidity is Lorentz invariant. That you also see this in this in this phase space measure. And just for, for reference, here's the, uh, here's the connection between rapidity and light cone variables. So plus and minus variables are this transverse mass and then exponential of rapidity, exponential of plus rapidity or exponential of, of minus rapidity. Good. So that was just a kind of a quick walkthrough of some uh, conventions. Now I'm gonna switch to the blackboard, but this is a good time to stop and uh, if there are any questions, so. I will just uh, leave this this here to for your uh, for your reference. <clears throat> Good. Okay. So now we're gonna 
talk about iconal scattering. So I iconal scattering or, or iconal approximation. And the iconal scattering is uh, the iconal so we're doing an approximation that is meant for high energy, high energy scattering. So high energy meaning that the longitudinal momenta are much larger than transverse momenta. You could also say forward scattering. If in of scattering angles, it is small angle. It is small angle scattering. <clears throat> and uh, what I want to do is that I want to go back a little bit to uh, quantum mechanics. And and so my, my different ways, but but somehow for the purposes of kind of CGC physics, uh, I want to go back to quantum mechanical scattering. So scattering of an external potential. So, so what we think about is that we have quantum particles, which are like you would encounter in advanced quantum mechanics course, a quantum mechanical scattering theory, not field theory, not particle scattering of particles but particle scattering of a classical potential, okay? Of course, you have different kinds of particles, different kinds of classical. We could do fermions, we could do scalars, uh, we potential, we could do potential, and, and all of these have good, and, and the books that I have uh, do this, uh, do it in a different, so like Barone and Predacci look at scalar potential, but what I want to do is that I want to, want to I want to consider scalar particle scattering of a gauge, abelian gauge potential. So scalar particles. And abelian. So scalar particle scattering of an electromagnetic field, so scalar e electron. So how do we describe a scale, this kind of a scattering problem? Well, what is the equation? And we want to do it relativistically. We don't want to do non-relativistic physics. We want to do it relativistically from the, from the beginning. So what is the, how, how do we describe how a scalar quantum mechanical particle uh, interacts with a classical electromagnetic abelian gauge field? We write down equation of motion, which is uh, the Klein-Gordon equation, okay? So Klein-Gordon I believe it's Klein-Gordon, Klein-Gordon, not Gordon. Yeah, no, Klein-Gordon. So Klein-Gordon equation. Okay, so let's uh, just write it down. I, I always get my eye. Don't, don't, try, don't ever trust any signs of eyes in my overall any, anything that I write. So what is a Klein-Gordon equation? We have a, uh, we want to have a, instead of a derivative, we want to have a covariant derivative like this. And then the Hermitian conjugate of the covariant derivative. like this, acting on some scalar field phi. And this should be, this should be plus or minus, this should be, I want this should be m squared. And now I already fully messing up. Yes, I don't have a minus here. I don't want to have a minus here. Like this. Okay. Kind of, Here's our equation of motion. So what is the physical, what is the physical that we want to study? The situation is that we want to look at some scattering of some, so, so there's some region space time where we have a vector potential. And then we want to look at scattering where we have a particle that is in, coming in uh, from infinity and, and uh, scattering a little bit of this external potential. So what does the wave, func wave function look like? So in this region, our wave function is going to be uh, 
let's choose it to be a plane wave okay that's the that's the solution that we want for our <clears throat> that's the solution that we want for our particle um, this region now i want to this is why i i introduced the light cone uh, uh, light particle to be a relativistic particle that's going to go in the positive in the positive direction along the z axis okay so it's a light like particle i could of course say that okay i i want to look it at i want this this initial state before the scattering it is of course at at early time time going to minus infinity but this is a light like very very fast relativistic particle coming in from minus infinity so so minus infinite time going to minus infinity this particle should also be at z coordinate minus infinity okay and it's 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 annoying to keep track of time and z coordinate all the time so instead what i will say is that this is the initial condition for x plus going to minus infinity i want to solve the equation so here you're kind of i'm i'm not doing light cone quantization because i'm just doing klein gordon equation uh, but I am do work. I want to do go to a coordinate system where I really think x plus as a time, and x plus is the relevant time coordinate for this high energy particle that's going in the positive z direction. So, so kind of implicitly, I'm purpose of this equation. I don't need to say what is time or what is not. I mean, it's just a relativistic covariant equation. But well, scattering problem somehow time coordinate. Okay, so I want to solve the klein gordon equation with an initial condition where my field phi at x plus going to minus infinity is a plane wave. Okay, so what else? I need, I want this plane wave to be a very high energy particle. I want to scatter, study the scattering of high energy particles uh, from a target. <clears throat> so I uh, the vector this vector k to be a i will choose it in the way large k plus it could uh, well, transverse momentum and go with a mass m squared This is the minus component of its momentum. So I'm just going to be say uh, which so k I want to study high energy particles. So k plus is large. So this is very small. So this is just approximately the momentum of my incoming particle is just approximately has just a k plus component. I'm, I'm going to neglect everything everything else. <clears throat> okay. And then the other thing. Good, good. So this is my physical situation. High energy particle coming from minus infinity. And I want to solve this, understand the scattering by solving this equation with this initial condition. So I'm going to do it uh, using an unmatched. Uh, so the un is that somehow that. Um, this is a function that oscillates very quickly as a function of x plus uh, x mi x minus because it's um, <clears throat> so there's 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 a very rapid oscillation coming with this coming with this k plus right and then i'm assuming that everything else i mean that that's a rapid oscillation and i'm kind of assuming assuming that everything else is slowly varying with respect to that so i want to factorize out this rapid oscillation in order to have an equation that is kind of more benign so i will write down a, write an ansatz so saying that the solution to my equation is just this asymptotical uh, solution times something else okay so far I just separated out this rapid oscillation from my, uh, from my wave function and now the physical situation is oh I, I'm assuming that this 
a rapid oscillation given by this large momentum is completely here. And I will assume that this K plus this large momentum is much larger than any than any gradient of this phi that the, I'm assuming that this what, what is this 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 other phi what is left over here is a slowly varying function all its gradients so here it's a gradient divided by the function itself which is kind of the typical moment yes You're probably right. <laughs> yeah, so let's see. Um, if I have, so basically my, if I plug this, so, so, and I, when, when I have, when I'm operating plane wave, right plus or minus k mu right and this i so i i think you need to have the same sign here because i for example if i have this then it's going to give me a minus k mu. i think i should have put, put in a minus here this this will give me a minus k mu this will give me a minus k mu the minus signs cancel, and what I get is k squared equals to m squared, right? And then the sign here, of course, it depends on whether my particle has a positive or negative charge, and uh, who cares? It's, uh, but uh, but as I said, don't trust my signs. Trust your <laughs> check, 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 check the signs yourself. I you should never trust my you should never trust my signs oh and oh nothing i do want to have a minus here i want this to be a positive energy so i mean it doesn't really matter in the end but i minus i so i put in this ansatz uh, and then i'm gonna make yet another i, I need to make yet another uh, assumption or choice okay I am going to assume that I am in Lorentz gauge. So you all know about gauge invariance. You, know, you have a vector potential. You can do a gauge transformation and you can write your theory in a different way. So the vector potential, this vector potential is going to look different. You can choose a different gauge where this vector potential is something different. Yeah, uh, you also have to gauge transform this phi, okay? Uh, when you when you do that and the physics is equivalent but somehow equations equations might look different the vector potential might look different in a different gauge but physics should be invariant uh, and and you can use this freedom to somehow impose some conditions on your vector vector potential so i am going to Lorentz gauge condition So, and, and what I'm going to do in the following is, it's not going to be valid in, in all possible gauges, but it's going to, I'm going to do manipulations in this gauge. And towards the end of the week, we will be, I will be confusing you by going away from this gauge into another gauge. Okay. Good. So now everything is, everything is set. We have uh, an equation. And down. We have our equation, we have our ansatz. Let's plug in the ansatz into our equation. Um, I have a big risk of getting, getting confused here. <clears throat> so, uh, so now that I've inserted my minus i here, the, the trick is that i d mu is going to bring down a minus i so this is going to be a k k mu and then uh, my derivatives this is a product so my derivatives can act either on this exponential or they can act on this this other phi and i need to keep track of i need to keep track of both 
So the easiest uh, parts are the ones where all the derivatives act on this, right? So those parts will give me a uh, k mu, k mu, I'm gonna move the m squared to the left-hand side, minus m squared, um, exponential of i minus i k dot x phi, okay. Then uh, what other terms do I have? What other terms? Oh, and you see that in terms of solving this equation, this, this condition is very convenient in the sense that I have a quadratic equation, uh, but the first derivative acting on this is not, is not gonna contribute, right? Because I chose a gauge where d mu a mu is zero. <clears throat> um, okay, uh, so what? Do then I take, um, but then I have this quadratic quadratic expression. So I will have two terms. I will have two terms where one of the derivatives is act acting on the expo exponential, and the other derivative is acting on this uh, acting on this far. So I will have I think two times k mu times i d mu phi and all of this is uh, now multiplying the uh, minus i k dot x good then i will have um, then what else do i have uh, I also have uh, another pairwise thing where I have one derivative acting on this uh, oscillating exponent. And then I take uh, from the other term, I take the gauge potential uh, term. So that is gonna give me a two K mu and uh, minus E A mu. Phi exponential of minus i k dot x, and I think the only thing I am I am now missing is uh, just plus e a e squared a mu a mu exponential of minus i k dot x is whole thing is equal to zero. Okay, at least at least I have all the important terms. I might not. Oh, uh, there's one term, uh, of course, that I I was missing. I can take, I have, I can, I have two terms where I take the gauge potential and then the derivative acting on this. So I also have. Let me just sneakily put it in here. Minus two e a mu i d mu phi. X. Okay. Good. Good. I I hope this all the terms, and you can you can check me later if I if I missed something. Uh, so first, let's start simplifying this. This of course is zero. We conveniently split out the wave and the non-interacting non particles. So all of these so those terms go away. And now this is the point where we want to use our assumption now we want to do now we're doing the iconal approximation okay so we're going to use the thing fact, fact that our momentum k has one large component and only some of these terms in this equation are proportional to that large component and the other ones are not okay so where do i have a large k plus i have a some other color here yes I can have this k plus, I can have a large k here. And then I can have a large k here. I have an explicit k, uh, but not in here. There's no k here, right? And of course, from this whole equation, now I can, I have 
all the derivatives, I can cancel these uh, cancel these oscillating factors. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to actually say that okay, to the leading order in in high energy, I'm just going to be taking these two line terms. Those are the ones that have this large k plus. They are larger than anything else. Okay. So now my equation. My oh, and then uh, my k has only one large component, so I only take the mu equals plus term here, which means that now my equation is i d minus phi, and then the other term is uh, I move it to the right hand side e a. So. Um, K plus upstairs is and con, has an A minus so plus here. And uh, so this is, so I have a K plus A plus, which is the same as K plus A minus, remembering that my light cone coordinates go, indices go up and down. So confusingly, I will write this in this uh, minus, right? Confusing myself too. Hi. And then uh, I don't know, but there's maybe some sign or maybe not. Uh, who cares about who cares about signs? Okay. Yes. Good. So all of all of the physics in the high energy, all of the physics in the ring problem in the, is in this equation. So you see, uh, one of the things that you remark here is that only the component of the gauge potential matters, right? So kind of. In principle, I started with an arbitrary gauge potential that had four components. Okay, so I posed the Lorentz condition, but still there's transverse components. But the, the in this physical situation, they don't matter. They don't matter because I have chosen at a high energy probe, which has a large plus momentum, and the large plus momentum only couple large plus momentum probe coupled to the minus component of the gauge potential. It's really rooted in the fact that this gauge potential, it represents a spin one half field, right? If it was a scalar potential, it would be different. And that's why kind of, kind of uh, well, scalar potential only has one component, but fine. Uh, then if it was a gravitational potential, uh, it would be a spin two field, it called the momentum squared, right? So in this afternoon in the exercise session, the first couple of exercises are, are meant to somehow show you explicitly why, how this kind of explicitly in terms of the Feynman diagram calculations that are very elementary, simple Feynman diagram calculations that uh, most of you at least uh, know how to do in, in five minutes, how this, how this happens explicitly, maybe a, in maybe a language that you're more, fa more familiar with, but uh, but here it's the same thing. I just did this in the with the Klein Gordon equation. You can do it with Feynman diagrams. Feynman diagrams also. Okay. So now I have uh, my equation. So this is solve. I have to multiply mine the left hand side. And the solution of this equation is that phi is uh, exponential minus i e. Now I have to, uh, let me write this, phi of x plus, and of course phi depends on the other coordinate, the x plus factors here, uh, x plus dy plus a minus at y plus. And I'm not writing the other coordinates, but the other trans transverse and minus, uh, transverse and minus coordinates are there too, okay? Uh, I put the update because I, if I differentiate this with, res with respect to x plus, I pick up the upper limit from this uh, from this integral. So what is the lower limit? So for the lower limit, we have to look at uh, in our 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 physical situation. We started off uh, requiring that the solution, the full solution, should reduce to the plane wave in minus at minus infinity. So you see that if I put minus infinity here, then it take x plus to the lower limit to minus infinity, then this will just be an exponential of zero, meaning one, 
and then I satisfy my boundary condition at minus infinity. So with this choice for the lower limit, I will, with this choice for the lower limit, I will obtain, uh, <clears throat> I will satisfy the boundary condition that my incoming, incoming wave is what it is what it's supposed to be. Okay. Good. So now we have solved the Klein-Gordon equation, and and in principle, and this has everything that we need for. Uh, for the scattering problem. So let's, uh, I will introduce some, some notation. So I will call this, I, I, I like to call this, uh, so we solved our scattering problem. And I mean, we have the solution of the Schrodinger Klein Gordon equation, so everything can be dug out from there. What do we want to dig out from there? We want to uh, dig out a scatter cross-section, a scattering cross-section. So a scattering cross-section looks at, uh, re requires us to look at what is, how does the solution look like when we go out to x plus equals plus infinity, right? We want to, for a scattering problem, we want to look at what is the outgoing wave. Okay. So then uh, in, order, in order to look at the scattering problem, so out, The outgoing state is determined by looking at the solution of our line Gordon equation at x plus going to plus infinity. Okay, so let me take x plus to uh, infinity, and I just take the it only appears in the upper limit. So, so that's uh, that's uh, that's the limit we look at, and this is a uh, a quantity that I call the I would I call the iconal phase. I will denote it for by chi because that's I think what other authors use minus i e integral for minus integral for minus infinity to plus infinity d y plus a minus just an abbreviated abbreviated notation. So everything depends on this iconal phase, which is an in the, integral over this gauge field. In the along the light along the light like uh, trajectory, and now our, the solution of our full uh, equation. So before this ansatz, so we, I have to restore this uh, exponential factor here. Is exponential of my uh, of? Let me take this minus. Oh, sorry. I keep the minus, but I take the i away, and then I write this as i chi. This is our outgoing wave. Oh, the only thing. Oh, the only thing that our particle picked up from this from this gauge potential. It kind of looks like nothing happened because our particle we we had an incoming plane wave, and our outgoing particle is just the same incoming plane wave. It's just been multiplied by complex phase, and so. The, you know, I don't know about you, my first reaction would be that, okay, in quantum mechanical wave functions, a phase doesn't matter, right? It's uh, what you are, the only thing you, the only thing that, the only thing you need is, uh, the only thing that gives you physics is the absolute value squared of the wave function. So why, why does this phase matter at all? Uh, but that's not, that's not what happens in quantum mechanics. Somehow the, the fact that, the fact that the, wave function is just multiplied by a phase. Uh, in some sense, it has to be because unitarity has to be conserved, prob probability has to be conserved. The, the, the absolute value of the wave function cannot change into something crazy, but somehow something, something must happen if there is a physical scattering process, right? And, and that something, what that something is, is that the wave is somehow hidden, hidden in this phase. We can, uh, um, I, I, I somehow, so, so somehow the physics is in this phase. I, I will, uh, there's, a, there's a more detailed, there's a more detailed uh, derivation in the notes. I will just some state here that, okay. So I, I will first this, that this, this was my incoming wave. 
And then I will split this into one plus exponential of i chi minus one. Okay. So you see, I just added and subtracted one. <clears throat> Why did I do this? Because I want to I want to write this in a in a way where the outgoing wave is the incoming wave, which is the one plus scattered wave. So if you have done scattering theory in quantum mechanics, this is the way you write. You write solve the Schrodinger equation, write the solution of the Schrodinger, write the full solution of the Schrodinger equation as the incoming wave plus something. Uh, and that something is the scattering is the quantum mechanical quantum mechanical scattering amplitude okay and so from from right in this way what you get is that you get the cross section hmm, i will not have i have to take board space <clears throat> so again uh, the no uh, in the notes i have some kind of hand waving derivation for how you do this in some sense, this is basically the same thing you do in ordinary non relativistic quantum mechanics. The only difference is that I have these x pluses and x minuses rather than time and time and coordinate. Uh, but the basic idea is that, okay, by looking at this coefficient, the scattered wave, which I get, I take the outgoing wave, I subtract, take away the incoming wave. What is left is the scattered wave and the coefficient of the scattered wave. Uh, is the scattering amplitude, so I can write down in Q perp. Momentum that my particle gets, and uh, very soon is a good time to take a break, and we will write it as minus I over two pi V squared X perp exponential of dot X perp, and then my iconal phase one minus exponential of minus. Do I have a minus? No, I don't have a minus. I chi, which is a function of X perp. This. So this is my diff from this expression. I read off the cross section differential in transverse momentum which is given by one minus the iconal phase Fourier transformed from coordinate to momentum. And then this momentum becomes the momentum of the scattered particle. And I think this is a good time to take a break before we, I don't know, do we take 10 minutes enough for people to get coffee? And then we continue from here. Okay, so let's <coughs> continue. So we, at the scattering of a scalar electrically charged particle of a classical electromagnetic field, the high energy limit, and we obtain this kind of an expression for the cross section. So um, before we go uh, to colored particles and QCD, uh, a few remarks about this. First of all, of course, this is written in inside the an absolute value, and I just put a minus i here. Of course, the ex I, I could replace this minus i by one, and the value of the expression would not change. The reason I put this minus i here is that, <clears throat> as I mean, Leif talked about the optical theorem. So, you know the optical theorem. You know that there's there's a there's a convention about what is the meaning of the real an imaginary part of, of the scattering amplitude. The total cross section is given by the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude, right? So there's a convention of, you, can just, you cannot just multiply the scattering amplitude by I, uh, because then it would somehow cha <laughs> change the terminology. There's, there's a well-established terminology for what the imaginary and real part mean. And this is why there's a minus here. You can see that this is what happens is that when you multiply, when you expand this out in powers of the iconal uh, phase chi, the first term has a minus i, which cancels this. So, the, so what you see is that when you expand this, the at, at lowest order, the, the at lowest order the 
thing that is inside the absolute value is real. So at lowest order, the scattering amplitude is real. And that's how I thought the con convention is consistent. I'm not sure about the plus, for, plus versus minus. I think that has to do with, in this particular case, I think that has to do with whether, uh, well, I mean, electromagnetic interaction can be attractive or repulsive. Depend it depends on whether you're, the charge of your part, whether the charge of particle is plus e or minus e, and and so, and whether depending on whether the attract whether the interaction is attractive or repulsive, the scattering amplitude is positive or negative, and and I'm completely confused about what the convention what the convention would be there, but so, I, I'm not sure about the sign, but the fact that this imaginary unit there makes sense, okay, so, so coming from this imaginary, so, so what you see is that. Uh, first of all, uh, this amplitude has a real and imaginary part. So we made, so we in the iconal approximation, we made some approximations, right? Uh, but it turns out that this, that this approximation, so there are good things and bad things about this approximation. Every, every approximation is has bad things and we neglected something. In some sense, I think what we neglected, we neglect, well, we probably messed up. One of the things that we neglected is that we really messed up probably kind of uh, rotational symmetry and we messed up uh, 3D rotational symmetry, uh, symmetry because somehow we have, we have, a, have a situation where kind of, it does, this doesn't look like you, were, you would be able to get a, the correct result for scattering of a spherical hard sphere, which has a certain S wave. Uh, certain structure dictated by rotation invariance. This kind of thing was completely lost. Right? And we we messed up with rotational invariance, and this is not rotationally 3D rotational invariant. On the other hand, this uh, iconal approximation allowed us to get a result that is that is has terms to all orders in the field. So this was not a perturbative result. We have this this exponential resums all powers of the all powers of the field. Now in QED situation, electromagnetism, the coupling is so weak that you usually, usually perturbation theory is very good. In QCD, it's not obvious that perturbation theory is very good. So it is useful to have an approximation that allows you to re-sum a subset of some kind of corrections to all orders in perturbation theory. This is not, the approximation we did was not a perturbative approximation. It was a kinematical approximation, not a perturbative approximation. We're re-summing all orders in the coupling constant. Okay, so so we made a non per assumption that approximation that allows us to do a norm non perturbative calculation. We made an assumption that allows to allows us to do a calculation where the scattering amplitude has a real and an imaginary part in a way that is consistent with unitarity. So the unitarity of the S matrix imposes constraints like the optical theorem between the real and imaginary parts. And our approximation allows to do that, whereas kind of a perturbative in a perturbative approximation, I would have just kept the first lowest order perturbation theory would be just the first term. My amplitude would be, would be just real. I would have no understanding of the imaginary versus real part of the amplitude, right? So, so good and bad things about this uh, about this iconal about this iconal approximation. Good. So. Um, now let's do the same thing in QCD, and then we're immediately doing color glass condensate uh, physics. So what is color glass, glass condensate? CGC, and I, I will try to, in uh, lecture number three, I will explain where glass comes from. Uh, so the condensate part, and that's a little bit uh, tricky. But the color part is the color part is easy. The color part is part. Same thing for colored particles. Okay. So the idea is that uh, idea is that at small x there are gluons. In a high energy nucleus of energy. Uh, proton, the gluons that that the corresponding gluons 
So this has two uh, this has two things. This has two implications. This has implications that when a field is of the order of the coupling, uh, can be you, you can treat it as a well when the when something when the coupling is small, then one over is large, and when the field amplitude field can so this kind of many gluon field of one over the coupling has the implication that one can think of this as a classical field. On the other hand, it has the implication that that you cannot do perturbation theory how of g times a because that that g times a is of the order of and that's the so and g the coupling times the field is the thing that appears in the Lagrangian theory. You do perturbation theory in terms of. They tell you that you're doing perturbation theory in term in powers of the coupling, but because the power of the coupling always comes with a with a coupling always comes with a field, you're actually doing perturbation theory in coupling times the field. And perturbation theory can break down even if the coupling is weak. If the field is strong, so things about the CGC in at small x, you are thinking about color fields as being classical because there are many gluons. On the other hand, you need some way of calculating which is non perturbative because when the color field is large. You somehow need to be able to do a number of the calculation. And this kind of a iconal estimation is precisely what gives you a non perturbative way of non perturbative way of doing uh, scattering uh, scattering amplitude calculation. So in, Q, in QCD, it basically means that we are studying the interaction of some colored, for example, it could be something else. It could be a fault. It could be a quark and a quark dipole. It could be a gluon, which is interacting with interacting with the small x gluons, or interacting with some nucleus. So this is a nucleus A. It's a heavy iron jargon for nucleus. This is, for example, a quark. Which and calculate and what do you, what you do in this CGC picture is that you calculate scatter using in the iconal limit in the high energy using a high energy approximation scattering of the color field which you assume to be a color field of some target high energy proton or nucleus uh, and now it's a high energy scattering so maybe it is maybe of in this case, not to think as a high energy nucleus, it's better to think of this as a nucleus that can be at rest, but think of it as a high energy collision, which means that you can go to the rest from the nucleus and probe whatever it is. It could be a quark. It could be a quark dipole from coming from a virtual. Microphone is okay. Well, some I get warm. It's not picking up. Um, yes. So, so, so the basic of many C is doing the thing for scattering of a or some colored probe scattering of the color field, and and many things change. Things look relatively similar to uh, relatively similar thing to this. There's only one thing that changes. Which is uh, that you have to think about a little bit more about commutation relations and commutativity in the sense. Is you okay? So let's just quickly see how one could do the same thing for uh, for this kind of a for this kind of a situation. Say, for example, that this is a quark. So then we would uh, be solving the Dirac equation. So I d slash 
minus g a slash. So this is a Dirac, Dirac equation for this quark in a background color field. Uh, for this Dirac okay, for this Dirac equation, you could, for example, an uh, ansatz. And uh, the ansatz I would ansatz I would take is uh, to say that psi is some v, which we're gonna find out in a in a moment, <coughs> and then a plane wave minus i p dot x, and then u of p. This is a this is a spinner. So now let's talk about this component. So if this is a, this is a quark with momentum p coming in. So in this kind of a Dirac, so I'm writing this Dirac equation in matrix, uh, matrix form. So this is a very, very, very condensed notation. I think most of you probably understand what I'm talking about, but just to make, just to make sure, my a slash is, of course, you know that it is that an, that the slash has a Lorentz index, right? Uh, but my equation is also a matrix equation. In addition to a Lorentz index, there's also a color index where A goes from one to NC squared minus one, so NC is three. So gauge field has a color index also. And, and these are, if this now, if this is a quark, then these TAs are well, these TAs are NC times NC matrices. Okay, so very condensed. I have four by four Dirac matrices, three by three color matrices in this uh, in this in this condensed notation. So this means that my psi is a four times NC, so twelve component vector. Right, it has a Dirac index, which you know if you have ever seen the. Dirac equation, and then it has a color index. Uh, now here is this U. This uh, Dirac spinner takes care of the takes care of the stars. So this has this is a, this is a four component index. But <clears throat> but but somehow the somehow the the color needs to be somewhere and so the color I, I probably if i wanted to be really exact i would need to write this as a yeah okay so let's i would need to write down some initial color vector here too let's say that this u is let's say that this u is also it's not your usual u but it's a usual u times a unit matrix in color space right so because i I have an incoming particle that has a fixed color, so it has a, it has a, it's a unit matrix in color space, a unit vector in color color space, so it has some color component, and then this V is somehow representing what is happening to this color in the same way as this iconal phase is representing what this uh, what is happening. I mean, iconal phase is representing what is happening to the abelian color, and the abelian color is just the complex phase in the in the wave function, right? Good. So I can plug this kind of an ansatz into this equation and do the same thing and do the same kinematical approximations. Assume that my particle, incoming particle, has a very high energy. I'm only taking the leading components in that energy. And what I get is the following. What I get is the following equation that d, d minus v is going to be, I need to check. I'm hopeless with this. <clears throat> Minus I G. This is not an A slash, but this is still a matrix, but it's not a matrix in Dirac spinner indices. It's just a matrix in color space. Right? So I get this kind of an equation, or A minus, of course. Just the minus component, just the minus component matters. Good. So in the same way as I got <coughs> did for the abelian theory, I get this kind of an equation. Okay.
I think I changed the sign of my coupling G. <laughs> oh, uh, sorry. Deep up. Absolutely. You're right. E plus. So far, it's going to be. A, yes, I. Absolutely. We are going along the plus, along the plus time that traject along the trajectory of this high energy particle, which is going along the x plus axis. So this is. Oh, of course. Uh, just uh, I forgot to say this, but of course my. Just a clarification: a d plus means d over d x plus. In the as as usual in for uh, this kind of derivatives. Okay. Yeah. So Well, um, perturbatively, yes, but perturbative in some sense, we, we can, we, I, I think you can, that you can say that I'm solving for K plus, right? And I'm just keeping the leading term. It can be useful to go to high orders, and this is uh, and this is a big business nowadays. Uh, high, higher orders, uh, the the term that people use is uh, sub iconal. Uh, so, <clears throat> especially in the, I would say that as text of well, in heavy people, some pe people are doing what what could be described as, as sub iconal in in some sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, but in the, in the context of EIC physics, it, it's it's a very popular thing. Well, EIC physics, jet quenching physics, a lot of this kind of iconal approximation. This is actually if you do jet quenching calculations, there's a there's a lot of it is in in the way this kinematics is is treated. In some sense, a lot of jet quenching calculations are iconal, uh, at least to leading order, and people maybe present it in a different way. Uh, so jet quenching. Um, EIC physics, for example, uh, if in EIC physics, if you want to think about spin, spin is a completely sub-iconal effect. I, and the, at the iconal level, you don't care about spin at all. And of course, EIC also, this phenomenologically EIC, the square root S is not infinite. It's kind of a high-ish high energy collider, but not asymptotically high energy collider. So you want to look at corrections and these are people, people are doing this, but then it, it becomes much more complicated because there are different kinds of, cor there are different kinds of corrections and you need to worry about which one of these is it that you, you, you need to systematically see which correction you are looking at. There are corrections related to the spin of the particle. There are corrections related to explicit powers of one or K plus. You have to about okay, in addition to a minus, do I need to care about a tran transverse components? We, we, so which corrections come in at which order in this expansion? It gets complicated, but certainly there are many people. Uh, this is kind of the state of the art that people are doing this. Yes. <clears throat> Good. So we have our equation. So what is the solution of this equation? And I remind you that. Remind you that now this a a minus is a a t a, <clears throat> and all of these are functions of the coordinates, right? So if this was an if if this was just matrix, you would just say that the solution is uh, an exponential, like here, uh, that it's an exponential of a integral. Here the is uh, that v is a path ordered exponential minus i g if my boundary conditions tell me that i integrate from minus infinity dy 
a minus at y minus, right? So how many of you have heard of path ordering, path ordered exponentials? Most of you know what a path ordered exponential is, right? <clears throat> it is often presented to you in a way it is often presented to you in a, in a way that, that says that, okay, uh, path ordering is that in this case, it would be pi of x plus and psi of y plus some colored. Uh, uh, not plus is larger than phi, the one the one at a later time comes to the left, for example, or maybe right, depending on depending on your handedness. So, so this is the way you usually see it defined, right? A path ordering is a path order product is if the if the if x plus is larger, the one that is later, the corresponding operator comes to the left. Uh, or if y plus is larger, so y plus is later, so then the corresponding operator comes to the left. <clears throat> and this is perfectly fine. This is this is a perfectly correct definition. What it means in this case is that you expand this exponential. Use the definition of what a matrix one minute, definition of what a matrix exponential is. <clears throat> by expanding in powers, all of these powers are products of matrices, and then you order these products of matrices according to this, this rule. Uh, but what somehow, for me, it is actually better, better to think in the following way. That this, for me, this, the definition of a path-ordered exponential is that it is the solution of such a differential equation. And I think that's maybe may in some sense a more useful way of thinking about it. This is a differential equation. You can think of uh, solving, solving, for example, numerically, you can solve the differential equation by building up this from little pieces. You always take the previous piece, you multiply it always from the left. So you go forward in this time variable in the differential equation. Your solution at the previous time to get the solution at the next time step you multiply from the left you always multiply from the left multiply from the left and you build it up in infinitesimal pieces and that gives you a v and for me personally i i like to think of rather this path ordered exponential as being defined by this differential equation but it's equivalent yes now your question Ah, uh, yes, this plus, absolutely. Good. <clears throat> so in the same way, now we could, so the V, this path ordered exponential goes, replaces this exponential of the iconal phase uh, in this, I'm not going to write down an expression for the cross section. We we will essentially do that tomorrow. Uh, but that's the way that's the way you generalize this kind of an iconal scattering uh, approach to color fields, and then you're basically doing C, doing scattering of a CGC. You just need to have some kind of an idea of where this uh, some kind of an idea <coughs> of where this color field comes from. And uh, that uh, we can talk about also, uh, we can also talk about in the future lectures. So this is the, yes, uh, and I did not write the magic word. Uh, this ma The magic word is that this is the Wilson, this is a Wilson line. These are referred to as, as Wilson lines. Um, <clears throat> So a few words about this, uh, about the coordinates. So, uh, a few words about the coordinates. So of course, again, when we are looking at X plus going to, when we're looking at the scattering, we're taking the upper limit to plus infinity. 
Well, out of the four coordinates, x plus, x minus, and uh, x perp, this goes away because we integrate over it. The scattering problem, the scattering problem corresponds to integrating from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, so after integrating over it, our the Wilson line doesn't depend on this coordinate anymore. <clears throat> um, then this x minus is uh, x minus is that's actually where the glass is, right? And we're, we will we will come back to this on uh, in lecture number three. So in principle, our Wilson line all the time depends on the x minus, right? If I if I draw a draw it here. If I draw a space-time diagram, this is the x plus axis. This is the x minus. This is time going up, and z coordinate going like this. So I kind of have some this, the color field that I'm going through is somewhere here, right? And then my probe is going going through it, right? Uh, so the probe is measuring something that is integrated or x plus over the trajectory, but the probe is light-like, uh, more or less. The probe is going in the positive direction, and somehow what you kind of hand-wavingly see from this picture is that is that the probe is really because it's going in the plus because the probe is going through with a large p plus. It's only really seeing some seeing properties of the target at, at the single x minus coordinate. It's going, it's going orthogonal to the x minus axis. So the x minus, it doesn't see different x minuses. So that's why in these practical calculations, when you calculate cross sections with these, you just assume that Wilson line, the color field doesn't depend on x minus, right? And and the justification is that it. Well, sure it does, but 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 the probe in such a high energy scattering doesn't care about it because the probe is just going through, the probe is just measuring a single X minus, right? So you don't care about this, care about a potential uh, dependence on X minus. So then what is just a Wilson function of the transverse coordinate. So, so somehow, and this is the basic ingredient in uh, this is the basic ingredient in in a CGC cross section calculation, like like what we will be, be do tomorrow, are Wilson lines that are SU three matrices, so they are unitary matrices. <clears throat> they are unitary matrices because they're exp so it's it's an element of the algebra. So this is a unitary the unitary NC a unitary SUN uh, matrix, which depends on the transverse coordinates. And though that's the that's the ingredient. We are somehow instead of instead of somehow summing over gluons, one gluon, two gluon, three gluon, we're not somehow thinking about the target in terms of how many gluons it has. We're thinking about this is the degree of freedom that we are using to describe the target. An iconal scattering amplitude of a colored object depending on the transverse coordinate. And as you see from this expression, the transverse coordinate is then going to be related by a Fourier transform to the momentum transfer that this scattering particle gets when it goes through the color field. <clears throat> Good. Um, so Wilson line, these are the things, Wilson lines, and these are things that we will be dealing with for the rest of, uh, the rest of these lectures. Any questions at this point before I, yes. <clears throat> the momentum of the particle, um, the transverse momentum changes, but, but the momentum, but, the, but this particle that is going through, it, it's, it, it, will re, it will still be in a situation where it's, longi well, the longitudinal momentum we, yes, so the longitudinal momentum does not change, only the transverse momentum changes. So the idea is that the particle that is coming in has such a hard, large longitudinal momentum, it's going to come in with the longitudinal, large longitudinal momentum, it's going to go out with the same large longitudinal momentum. Maybe it'll get some transverse momentum, 
but anyway so little that it's still a small angle scattering it, the transverse momentum is going to be much less than the longitudinal momentum and so at, at leading order in in this high energy limit where we are ex assuming that the at leading order in this high energy limit the longitudinal momentum of the particle probe doesn't change and of course as you see that's kind of goes in hand with this uh, the fact that if our target does not depend on x minus it means that the target in x minus is the Fourier conjugate to k plus if the target does not depend on x minus the target does not have any k plus that it could give to the probe right so the target being independent of x minus is is the same thing as saying that the probe uh, the probe x plus a uh, probe p plus or k plus is conserved in the scattering <clears throat> good other questions Minus the formula is the same as the delta of y minus. Like it's well, it's, it's, I, yes, I did not, I did not explicitly write it here, but of course. So let me uh, write this a little bit more carefully. So this is x plus x minus x perp. And here, this is y, the y plus is the integration variable, but this is the same x minus and uh, the same x perp. Because somehow I'm only, the differential equation only deals with the plus component. So otherwise, both sides of this differential, both sides of this equation are at the same x minus and the same x perp. And then, then here, I just kind of say that, okay, I, the physics doesn't actually care about this, so I can assume not actually not going to depend on this variable at all and the, this one i'm integrating over and then with just the transverse Um, well, the homogeneity would uh, certainly not homogeneous in X perp in transverse coordinate. Um, X minus that that's actually precisely the, the glass aspect of it. Okay, it, it doesn't need to be homogeneous. It doesn't need to be independent of X minus, but it has to be slowly varying in X minus compared to the time scale at which the scattering takes place and the scattering that the time scale at which the scattering takes place is determined by the fact that you have a probe that has a high a high energy probe a high energy probe <clears throat> which has a large k plus and therefore only probes a, a therefore only probes a constant uh, probes the target at a fixed x minus <clears throat> in some sense in some sense, this is a little bit like taking a photograph. I mean, in ordinary, some ordinary orders of magnitude, if you take a photograph and the speed of light is very large, if you take a photograph, you are, you are measuring the properties of whatever the, that whatever the thing in the picture uh, at a fixed time, right? That doesn't and and some some the as long as your exposure exposure time is very short, you're taking a picture of it instantaneously. That doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that the, the thing that you're taking a picture of doesn't depend on time. It has it, it does its own thing, but somehow when you're you're taking a picture of it at a fixed time and then you don't care, the picture doesn't know. The picture doesn't care about the time dependence because it's an instantaneous thing. So like the same thing here, there's an X minus dependence. But our cross section doesn't care because the cross section is, is taking a picture of the of the target at a fixed x minus. It is slow, slowly changing in x minus compared to this time scale of the scattering. Um, 
Yes, so then that comes to the fact that um, a cross section is always uh, here. I mean, uh, uh, the physical situation in a cross section is different from the physical situation in, in a photograph. The physical situation in a cross section is that this particle is going, uh, if it somehow the particle is, is going in the flying in the LHC beam pipe, and, and the cross section, there's no reason why the cross section would be different if you measure it 100 meters down the B pipe at a different detector, right? That, so then, then the physical situation is, physical situation is, is somehow independent. And then the other thing is that the cross section is an expectation value over some kind of degrees of freedom of the target. And certainly even if the target somehow, even if the particle, let's say spin rotates as it's going down the LHC tunnel, the expectation value of, of some distribution is probably going to be the same, even if the even if the quantum mechanical state of the target is not exactly the same hundred meters that way, but it's going to be in the same it's going to be in the same state in the same ground state wave function. It's just going to be have some internal dynamics going to a different direction. But when you're taking an uh, taking an average over the wave function, it's going to be the same average. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you're averaging over different configurations of what this A minus, what this classical field is, right? And here, of course, the, the other, the, the one of the things that makes is, is, is the non-trivial thing in the classical theory is that, is that we're actually going to do, be claiming that you can just do a classical stochastical averaging over these. And this is a good enough representation of the actual quantum dynamics of the of the target and that's a very non-trivial statement oh so uh, so well, yes you well you can yes you can say that you average over x minus uh, but of course basically averaging over x minus and saying that somehow you're measuring something that doesn't depend on x minus practically it's the same thing right we we're, we're not going to be trying to describe the x minus dependence More questions? Before we finish, I will just make a uh, short uh, remark, which is maybe a, a little bit kind of related to what we what I want to do in the tutorial session. I will just tell you what is an icon or vertex. So, so far, right now, we, we have been doing scattering of a classical potential. So just to make a little bit connection to Feynman diagram calculation that you are most likely used to from uh, particle physics, quantum field theory courses. So you're, you're used to calculating Feynman diagrams, I, I assume. You're used to calculating cross scattering amplitudes. So, uh, so the iconal vertex is, uh, is kind of the, the same approximation, the same iconal approximation in the language of Feynman diagrams, okay? So the iconal vertex says that if you are taking, calculating things with, for example, quarks scattering on a gluon or a gluon scattering on a gluon, or maybe you could have some uh, charged, a color charge scalar particle, who knows, scattering of a gluon. The iconal, iconal vertex is saying that you, that all of these, all of these interactions in the specific kinematical limit can be, uh, can be replaced by, by one single uh, vertex, that all of these inter, all of these interactions in the iconal kinematical limit are actually the same. And this is saying that if my incoming particle has a P, here there's a momentum Q going out. This is P minus Q. Uh, 
that this that the iconal vertex is saying that the Feynman rule and now this thick line it can be anything it can be a quark it can be a gluon it can be a it can be a scalar particle it can be anything any colored particle the iconal vertex is saying that the Feynman rule in the limit when p is much larger than q so this is the iconal limit so that I have a high energy particle which comes in at high energy goes out at high energy and then interacts with some some uh, interacts with some gluon whose energy is much much smaller a soft gluon in this limit uh, all of these are just two it's just two in my conventions which I think here this is the normal convention except for the plus or minus sign uh, uh, that this vertex is just uh, two i and then let me spin uh, so then here there's a spin s and then here there's a spin s prime times some color so the iconal vertex so the iconal vertex is the equivalent of this iconal approximation the equivalent of this kinematic approximation when you're doing a Feynman diagram calculation and the, so the statement is that whenever you have a high energy particle that is interacting with a soft photon it's either so I, I'm drawing it, this the gluon straight down so of course could be a could be a photon too same thing happens and drawing it say, straight down which means that it could be absorbing it or it could be emitting it and of course, as you know, in a Feynman diagram, the diagram is the same. You just have to see what the signs of the signs of the momenta are. But whether you're absorbing or emitting a soft particle, <coughs> the coupling of a colored particle to the soft gluons or soft photons is always the same. It's always two. That's a kind of the con that's the way the convention works. Uh, there's an I. I guess it has to be I because there's some herm Hermitian hermeticity requirement uh, then it's proportional to the momentum of the particle it conserves spin and then there's a color factor which of course depends on what what is the color representation of this uh, uh, color particle <clears throat> as you know if you know this if you know the Feynman rules for these kind of these kind of grams they are different uh, but the statement is that in the high energy limit the difference doesn't matter uh, that the differences are you only see the difference between <clears throat> difference between this particle being a quark and, and, and a gluon you only see, really see the difference when this is a hard scattering not when this is soft scattering one minute in some sense in some sense this iconal limit is a it's a classical radiation limit yes Oh, and yes, there's a coupling constant, of course. Yes. G. So one, one way to one way to justify this is that um, okay, so this so the the quark and the gluon have some spin. Okay. So they have yeah, spin one half, spin one. Um, but in the limit one one aspect is that in the limit of okay. So the quark, these particles can have some spin, but the essential thing about this kind of a scattering is that this, the gluon here, this gluon is a spin one particle, and a spin one particle always the coupling of a spin one particle. It's a vector particle, represented by a spin a vector gauge potential. It always couples to some current, and really somehow these kind of diagrams. What the Feynman rule for these diagrams is is equivalent to asking what is the current that it couples to right and now this current it's a four vector it has to be a four vector Lorentz invariance dictates that it's a four vector it's it's a four vector that has to depend be constructed from some other four vectors so what other four vectors do we have we have the momentum of this guy and we have the spin of this guy so the statement is that in the limit when this is a high energy particle its spin doesn't matter and the only four vector that uh, the current is always going to be proportional to the momentum and that is true when the momentum is large it is not true 
when uh, when when the momentum is smaller, then the then the spin influence, then the spin affects what this current is, and then the, your then this particle, then this gluon cares about the spin of these particles. But in the high energy limit, this gluon only cares about the momentum of these particles. <clears throat> so that's why all colored particles in the high energy limit uh, interact with gluons in the same way. So there's a certain universality. And I think one, one, one can track this universality really back to the fact back to the fact that this is really the in, in, this is a really a classical limit because this is a limit where you don't care about the spin of this particle, and then where the momentum momentum of this particle, the energy of this particle is so high that actually this this interaction doesn't care about doesn't care about the difference between p and p minus q, and when you're neglecting the fact that that this, when you're neglecting the fact that this particle is taking away some momentum and you're neglecting the spin, essentially you're neglecting all of the quantum quantumness of this particle. And then this kind of a approximation is just a classical radiation of a classical acceleration, deceleration, or classical radiation of a classical charge particle. So that, that's a so this kind of classical physics limit is there in Feynman diagrams it's not really people don't really tell, usually tell you that they, that it's there but it's there and i think this kind of an approximation is the is the approximation that gives you the kind of a classical classical particle classical emission limit but i think this is a good place to stop unless there are further questions here yeah.